Well, welcome to worship this week. So glad you could join us as uh, we mark this coming week Canada Day. And so we're going to be singing O Canada in a few minutes. Uh, but as uh, we come to that, we're actually going to talk about uh, a little bit about our relationship as Christians with politics, sort of, with uh, others. And we're going to talk about especially those moments when it kind of gets a little bit messy. Um, and who we should be, how we should respond when uh, when. Things don't always go the way we would expect or when other people's behavior is not what we would uh, expect of fellow Christians. Uh, Before we get to that, though, a couple of things to mention. We have a congregational meeting coming up on June the 29th. We have a couple of things we want to do in our bylaws. We have uh, also want to vote on some delegates to convention. And we want to update you on our retiring treasurer and what the new... uh, how the new system will work after that. Uh, Jim is retiring after 17 years, so if you see him, wish wish him well uh, in that. Uh, If you're interested in going to Oasis, to our uh, convention uh, this summer, it's going to be virtually, it's going to be online, so it'll be easy to get to, uh, but we are looking for some delegates from from our church to go to convention, so if you're interested in that, let myself or let Lisa in the office know about that. Summer camps. Uh, the rules have changed here in New Brunswick, and we're allowed to have a few more kids, 10 more kids per camp, so those spaces are opening up. We have some on a waiting list, but uh, there are a few spots left for each of the summer camp weeks. And it also will allow us to start Children's Church. So Children's Church will begin again next Sunday, July the, 20, July the 4th uh, as well. I think that's all the things I wanted to kind of highlight. We're going to begin with O Canada, and this uh, o version of Canada that we're going to sing with is a version that was recorded last year when we actually weren't meeting in person, uh, but is a part of our, our family of grace leading us in O Canada. So I'm going to invite you all to stand together as we sing O Canada.
uh, the motto of from sea to sea to sea actually comes out of Scripture. It comes out of Psalm 72. Psalm 72 is actually a prayer for the king, for our leaders. And so as we begin, uh, as we come to a call to worship, it's really going to be a prayer for our leadership, uh, for the role that God has created for them, and, uh, and then uh, to praise our Lord. So Psalm 72 says this, Endow our leaders with your justice, O God, and with your righteousness. May they judge people in righteousness, your afflicted ones, with justice. May they defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. May they be like rain falling on a mown field, like showers watering the earth. May they deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. May they rescue people from oppression and violence, for precious is their blood in God's sight. Praise be to the Lord God, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever, and may the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Let's indeed praise the Lord together. You can feel free to remain standing as you like or seated as you like. But continue to wear your mask as you sing. And those who are um, watching us online for the first time, uh, we sing during our worship to give praise and adoration to God.
Father God, as we come to you on this week, and we remember the birth of our nation, we know that uh, we are as a nation in some uh, troubled times for various reasons, whether it be uh, the pandemic, whether it be dealing with some of our uh, history. Uh, and yet, Lord, we know that as we come uh, as citizens of this nation, it is your call to us to pray for the uh, for the good of this nation, for the peace of it. And so we ask, Lord, indeed, that uh, during the midst of, or as we hopefully continue to make strides towards overcoming this pandemic, that your hand of healing and of hope might go across this nation, that you would be uh, empowering and, uh, and blessing those who have been on the front lines and our medical staff in particular, and just uh, continue to uh, encourage and strengthen them as they seek to uh, continue to serve during these days. Uh, as we have uh, prayed also, we, uh, as we're dealing with uh, various political issues, we ask, Lord, that you would just help um, compassion, uh, reconciliation, uh, peace, uh, justice to be hallmarks of who we are as Canadians and as a people. Lord, as a church, as we seek to be a blessing in our, um, in our nation and in our city, we pray that you would continue to guide us. Pray for the undercurrent mission coming up in a few weeks' time, and as we uh, seek to just uh, partner with um, local uh, charities, uh, whether it be the food kitchen, food kitchen or multicultural or Chrysalis House, that you would just use those opportunities that we are taking to serve in those places to be able to be a blessing to them, but also to help us to understand a little bit more of our neighbors and to learn how to love our neighbors even more deeply. Pray, Father, for uh, summer camps, as we've talked about, uh, be it the day camps here at Grace or the uh, week-long camps at Green Hill Lake, or the camp that we support in this area. And we pray, Lord, that as children have opportunity to gather together, to have fun together, uh, that they will also hear your word, uh, hear your spirits tugging upon their hearts to draw you close to them. We uphold those who are in hospital right now, for those who are recovering from surgery, for those who are facing uh, changes in life, and just ask that you would be near and put your compassion, uh, your hand of strengthening upon them as well. And Lord, as we continue to look into your word uh, this day, we ask that you would open our eyes, open our ears, and that you would be our vision for that which you have for us as your people. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's continue to worship in him. Psalm 119, 18 says, Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law.
Amen. Scripture this week is from Romans chapter 13. We're going to read the entire chapter. Uh, It's only 14 verses. Romans chapter 13 and reading the entire chapter. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authority that exists has been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from the fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to authorities, not only because of the possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another, for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime and not in carousing and drunkenness nor in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. As we uh, continue our summer stumpers this week, the, the question this week was actually a series of questions. And at the time that the question came in, uh, there was a church in Alberta that was making national headlines for refusing to stop meeting in person for worship or for refusing to follow the guidelines, the COVID restrictions. The first week, the church was warned. The next week, they were fined. And the next week, the RCMP actually surrounded the building with a fence and locked it down. At the same time, a pastor in another Western Canadian church, who that was also defying the law, was arrested for his continual defiance. And as he was being arrested by the police, he was calling the police officers Nazis and other derogatory names that I don't really wish to to repeat. And so that was all going on when this question came in, and I think probably had a lot to do with the question. The question was, how are Christians supposed to react to the news and the criticism regarding churches that appear to be disobeying the law and protocols associated with the pandemic? Is there anything in the Bible that leads these churches to believe that disobeying the rules and laws are acceptable? How does that jive with Christians who are supposed to be loving and kind and considerate and compassionate and respectful to others? How do we respond to people who are critical of churches based on the actions of these churches? And so you can see there's a whole series of questions, and I simply simplified the question to how do we respond when other Christians' behavior is embarrassing to us? And I did this in part because uh, the behavior around the pandemic is not the only thing that's ever troubled or embarrassed me. On January 6th of this year, it was very familiar, a mob stormed the Capitol building in Washington and tried to usurp the results of the election. And they did it 
while waving Christian flags and playing Christian music and holding signs with Christian themes and slogans. And for me personally, I have felt awkward and concerned about the number of white evangelical Christians who have worshipped Trump over the last five years. And I feel bad because of the damage that it's doing to the church's witness in the world. I also feel awkward when some Christians, or the way some Christians speak about our Canadian politicians as well, either demonizing them or idolizing them. And beyond politics, there are the sex scandals, the financial abuses, the corruption among clergy and Christian leaders that have come to light over the years, and they have often left me saddened or disheartened, and at times they have left me in shock and dumbfounded. So what are we supposed to do? How do we respond? What do we say to people who question why the church is like this? I want to give you first three things to remember and then three ways to respond. Three to remember and three to respond. Remember, first of all, that not everyone who identifies themselves as Christian are actually followers of Jesus. Matthew 7, Jesus is preaching the Sermon on the Mount, and he starts to talk about true and false prophets, and he says this, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Jesus was essentially saying, you will know some people are fake followers because they are ferocious. He talks about them being thorns and thistles as well. But he gets even more direct. He says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name perform miracles? And I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. In other words, there are people who claim Christianity but have no real connection to Jesus. But they make a big splash in the news. We know that media often looks for the worst of the worst to report on because that's what brings in viewers. That's why we tune in. When media looks for stories, they often highlight the most extreme examples. And yet you and I know that the vast majority of those who have a close walk with Jesus will not become one of those extremists. An overwhelming number of Christians... Uh, sorry, an overwhelming number of churches did not defy the laws around the pandemic. And there are Christians that I know and surely that you know who volunteer with the homeless and food banks and visit the sick and the elderly and work with disadvantaged kids and fellowship with their congregation every week. And they might vote conservative, they might vote liberal or NDP or green or, or something else. They are deeply spiritual people and they are people who are single, they are people who are married, they are people who are wealthy or middle class or just barely scraping by, but it's their fruit and not just their words, the product of their lives that lets us know whether they're followers of Christ or not. So remember what Jesus said, not everyone who says they are Christian, followers of me, are. Secondly, remember that you are not a perfect Christian. That Christians can be wrong. They can be wrong even when they have the right motives. They can be wrong even when they have the wrong motives that haven't been brought under Jesus' control yet. Paul told the Romans this. He said, I want to do good, and yet evil is right there within me. My inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law waging war uh, within my mind, making me a prisoner to sin that's working within me. What a wretched man I am. Who is going to rescue me? And then he says this, thanks be to God who delivers me through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said he still has moments of failure and struggles. Sometimes we all are in the wrong. We make a mistake. We do an incredibly embarrassing thing. And so we need to learn how to have compassion compassion and patience with those who may be doing things that cause us to cringe. There may be times when you or I could be that embarrassment to others. When someone asks you about another Christian's behavior, maybe, maybe something in what we say needs to be that I'm not perfect either. 
So remember, not everyone who says they're Christian are Christian or followers of Christ. Remember, you and I are not perfect Christians either. And remember, finally, that it's not our job to save the church. Paul told Timothy that Jesus saves us, calls us to a holy life. It's actually God's work to save the church. Our calling is to make disciples and to teach and to be examples of what it is to be followers of Jesus. We are not called to wage war on our neighbors or with people. We are, Paul says, engaged in a spiritual battle, but he says it's not with flesh and blood. It's with powers of darkness and spiritual forces of evil and heavenly realms. So we do not look to politicians or politics or protests to be the savior of the church. We do not think that God cannot save his church. That even as perhaps individual churches may falter, the church, the church continues to thrive and to grow. And if the church is all we believe it is made to be under God, then we should have no fears that the church will endure even the worst of what the world has to do to her. So our job is not to save the church. That's, that's God's. That's Jesus' work. Our calling is to seek to win hearts and lives for Jesus. Changed lives will change our world. We're called to make disciples, followers of Jesus. So how are we to respond? I want to suggest three ways we can respond. And they come from chapter 13 of Paul's letter to the Romans. But overall, the theme, the one big idea is simply this. Don't be those Christians. Don't be those Christians. Be real in your faith. Be a follower of Jesus. Do what you need to do to develop your own personal, intimate relationship with God that shapes your life. Don't pretend to be perfect. Don't try to usurp the place of God. Don't be the Christians who, who do these things. And instead, we respond by, first of all, following the law. Following the law. Submitting to earthly and governing authorities. That's what Paul's writing about in those first seven verses of chapter 13. Paul says, if you break the law, you should be afraid because the law is there to punish evildoers. Paul tells the Christians to obey the law. He tells the Romans that he's writing to, you need to pay your taxes and give your leaders the respect and honor that they are deserving because of their position. And this is not the only place. Paul says the same thing in 1 Timothy chapter 2. He says the same thing again in Titus chapter 3. Paul wrote this, Peter, sorry, Peter wrote the same thing in chapter 2 of his first letter. And remember, as they are writing these letters, they're writing about a Roman government that is in charge at the time. Now, there are certainly times when it is right to disobey. Daniel disobeyed a law that told him he was not allowed to pray. Early Christians died because they would not deny Jesus as Lord and worship Caesar. Worship Caesar. When laws specifically prohibit our faith or force one to deny their faith, one would have reason to conscientiously object. But pandemic limitations are not those laws. They are about keeping people safe. And as Christians, we should be leaders in wanting to help people stay safe. God told the Jews living in exile in Babylon, seek the peace and the prosperity of that city to which I have carried you in exile. Pray to the Lord for that city, because if it prospers, you will prosper. And so Christians should participate in society. Christians should vote. They should express their opinions respectfully as citizens, but we also obey the law, even the laws we don't like. So Paul tells the Romans, first, follow the law. Secondly, he says, love your neighbor. Verses 8 to 10 are all about loving your neighbor. Paul says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another, for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. Love does not harm the neighbor, and therefore love is the fulfillment of the law, Paul writes. One of the most disturbing things about some of the Christian behavior that you see in these examples are how hateful it is. Name-calling, slandering, 
shaming people, even violence. That is not the example of Jesus, and it's not our calling. Loving our neighbor is the second great command, and Paul says that if you can do that, you won't be breaking the other commands, like stealing and killing and coveting and adultery. And I might add, being judgmental or condemning. Love, Paul wrote, does not seek to harm the neighbor, even even the neighbor who seeks to harm us, even the neighbor with whom we disagree, even the neighbor who is embarrassing as a brother or sister in Christ. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul expresses disappointment in the number of Galatians who who are going astray in their faith. And commenting on that passage, Martin Luther wrote 500 years ago, towards those who have been misled, we show ourselves parentally affectionate so that they might perceive that we seek not their destruction but their salvation. Martin said, basically, we need to love wandering Christians. We need to love them the way a mother or father would love a straying child. And that way we'll show them that we're, we're, not, we're not seeking their destruction or their punishment, but we're seeking what's best for them. We're seeking reconciliation. We're seeking restoration. We're seeking to bring them back the right way. And so the best responses then are, first of all, simply to follow the law and then to love your neighbor. And then finally, to keep calm and pray on. I have three coffee mugs in my office. One that says, I love daddy, or I love dad. Uh, One that says, hope is strong and trustworthy anchor for our soul. And one that says, keep calm and pray on. The phrase, keep calm and carry on, was originally a, a British slogan in the early days of World War II. And the idea was simply that in the chaos of those moments, that they were asking people to keep calm, to not lose focus, to do what you were supposed to do, and in that attitude would help win the war. Well, Paul kind of says the same thing in these last verses of Romans 13 as he looks towards the end of time. It's all about the second coming of Jesus, but he says, now is not the time to behave foolishly as we think about Christ, but to behave decently. And he focuses mostly on respectable moral living. He says, now is not the time to run around drunk or be promiscuous. He throws in, though, dissension and jealousy. Rather than being cantankerous and argumentative and disagreeable, Paul says, behave decently. To me, that kind of sounds like rather than engaging in pointless, divisive debates and stirring up trouble, we should learn how to keep calm. I think this especially applies to our activity in social media, where it is so easy to go astray and to get lost in the chaos. Keep calm. Don't give in to negativity. Don't get swept up in outrage. Don't be crude. Don't be mean. Don't attack people. Don't act like you are perfect. Don't fake humbleness. Don't blindly trust everything you read on social media. Don't blindly share everything that labels itself as a Christian quote. Instead, be an encourager. Be grateful. Speak or write or post calmly. And above it all, bathe everything in prayer. Paul didn't actually put the prayer part in there, but he says this. He says, Put on Jesus. Embody Jesus. Do you know the the word Christian only appears in the New Testament three times? That it's actually not a name that we gave ourselves as followers of Jesus. Acts chapter 11 uh, says that the disciples, the followers of Jesus, were first called Christians at Antioch. See, the Greeks love to give nicknames to groups of people who are following a particular leader. They called the people who followed General Pompey, Pompeians. To those who supported Emperor Augustus, they called them Augustinians. 
And so it made sense as they met these people who were always talking about Jesus, uh, followers of Jesus, to call them Christians. It just means little Christ. To call ourselves Christian is to say that we are a follower of Christ. But don't miss this point. The Greeks first called believers Christians because they imitated Jesus. They obeyed Jesus' commands. They pledged allegiance to Jesus. And all of those should still be true for Christians today. Living up to our calling is the way that we make a difference. There was an article in the London Times in December of 2008 which caused a lot of stir among atheists and Christians alike. The article was written by Matthew Paris, and it was entitled this, As an Atheist, I Truly Believe Africa Needs God. And I'm going to read for you a long quote, long quote, but listen, as an atheist argues for the value of Christianity and why. Matthew Paris wrote this, Before Christmas, I returned after 45 years to the country that as a boy I knew as Naziland. Today it's called Malawi. The Times, the paper that he wrote for, the London Times, the Times Christmas Appeal included a small British charity work there. Pump Aids helps rural communities install a simple pump, letting people keep their village wells sealed and clean. And I went to see the work. It inspired me renewed my flagging faith in developmental charities. But traveling in Malawi refreshed another belief, too, one that I have tried to banish all my life, but an observation that I have been unable to avoid since my African childhood. It confounds my ideological beliefs. It stubbornly refuses to fit into my worldview. And it has embarrassed my growing belief that there is no God. I, a confirmed atheist, I have become convinced of the enormous contribution that Christian evangelism makes in Africa. Sharply distinct from the work of secular NGOs, government projects, internal, international aid, these alone will not do. Education and training will not do. In Africa, Christianity changes people's hearts, brings spiritual transformation. The rebirth is real. The change is, is good. I used to avoid this truth by applauding the practical work of the mission churches. It's a pity, I would say, that salvation's a part of their package. But Christians, black and white, working in Africa, they do heal the sick. They do teach people to read and to write. And only the severest kind of secular person could see a mission hospital or a school and say to the world, say that the world would be a better place without it. And I would allow that faith was needed to motivate the missionaries. But that doesn't fit with the facts. Faith does more than just support the missionary. It is also transferred to the flock. This is the effect that matters so immensely and which I cannot help but observe. Christians were changing people's hearts and changing their lives and bringing good. Peter told his readers in 1 Peter 2.12, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. Can we not live in such a way so that even an, athe even an atheist would say, I may not believe, but they are changing the world for God's good. This is the key to how we need to respond so that others, uh, not how we need to respond when others do not live that way. We need to respond by following the law. We need to respond by loving our neighbors. We need to respond by keeping calm and praying. We need to respond by being the example of Christ in our world. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you this day for Jesus. We thank you for the salvation, the hope, the eternal life that is ours in him.
Thank you also, Lord, that he has shown us how to go, how to follow him. We pray, Lord, that as we follow Christ, people can truly say they are Christians. This we pray, this we ask, in Jesus' name, amen. want to say thank you for joining us or being with us again this week. It's so good to have you with us and happy Canada Day uh, to you. I hope that you'll get to uh, enjoy the day with, uh, with some family and friends uh, in a responsible way during these days. Uh, next week, we're actually, we're, we're hitting a number of really difficult topics this uh, summer through the, some of these stumpers. And there's, there's several of them that are fairly close together in their topics. So next week, we're actually going to talk about Christians who deny their faith, Christians who then say that they are not Christians anymore. And we're going to look at a passage in Hebrews that, that uh, talks about that um, in, a very, in a way that might be disturbing for some of us. So check out Hebrews chapter 6 uh, and uh, co- join us next Sunday as we, as we look at that issue. Until then, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn towards you and give you peace in Jesus' name. Amen.